My name is Jeff Nichols. I'm a filmmaker. Um, I have made three movies that have been released, and I'm currently working on my fourth. I've been really lucky that each film that I've made has gotten a larger and larger budget. And kind of despite that, um, I've been able to maintain some creative control. I write each of my films, uh, I direct each of my films, and I have final cut over their edits. So if you've happened to actually see one of my movies um, and you don't like it, it is totally my fault. Um, there's no one else to blame. The good thing about that is over the course of three films, I've actually been able to develop a point of view as a filmmaker. It doesn't always happen in this business. But because of that control, I've been able to think about my films and put something very personal into each of them. In my first film, Shotgun Stories, I actually didn't know what I was doing uh, when I started it. Uh, it wasn't until after the film was finished and I read one of the first reviews that I realized I, I had a point of view. There was this review that came out that said both the camera and the characters were languid, uh, which is a really fancy way of saying the movie is really slow. The funny thing is when I read it, I agreed. And I actually, I actually thought I meant to do it. Uh, I just had never been forced to enunciate it before. Uh, I'd financed that film with friends and family's money, and nobody asked me why I was doing it. I was just doing it. My first film, Shotgun Stories, follows a feud between two sets of half-brothers. And the violence escalates. It essentially is a revenge narrative. Revenge narratives, typically, westerns, action movies, uh, it follows a good guy whose buddy gets killed or something, and he chases him and then eventually shoots him or drops him off a building. And as an audience, we feel really good because the bad guy got what he deserved. Um, but I wanted to subvert that. Uh, I wanted to subvert that idea, even though I didn't really know I was doing it. Um, and the first thing to do was to make a film that was very still, very quiet. Also, that's because I chose to, to follow the lower class set of brothers. Typically, these guys would be the bad guys in the movie. Um, but I wanted to figure out what they were about and humanize them. Uh, the thing about them is uh, they're not upwardly mobile guys. They're like these white trash redneck guys in southeast Arkansas. And they weren't making progress in their lives. If anything, through their actions in the film, they were hurting themselves. And as a result, I thought about the camera, and I thought that it should just be still. They aren't moving, so we aren't moving. And oddly enough, there's a tension in the film that ratchets up, and the camera still doesn't move. It's almost oppressive. Um, the way that you have to watch it. So I want to show you this clip, uh, a little bit of context. This scene follows two of our main characters after they find out that their younger brother has been killed and they're standing outside the hospital. And they mention uh, uh, a character's name and, and that happens to be the younger brother's fiance. I get back inside, talk to this person. What kind? Did you go by Annie's mom? Let her know. Yeah, I will. Somebody's gonna have to tell Cheryl. See you at home. That was two shots. It was a wide shot and it was a close up, a close up raking shot. So one character's in the foreground, one character's in the background. 90% of directors, myself included, when that character turns to look at the other one, you would rack focus. You would go to him. I didn't. Um, I didn't really know why on set I didn't. I just thought it was cool. But when you start to think about it, you realize that it forces you to stay with that other character. It forces you to think about him. Um, it's his point of view. Uh, and he's trying to take control of a situation he has no control over. So then that starts to bring up this idea that, that this bigger point of view that you're trying to make as a filmmaker, this idea, this theme, um, it's all supported by this disparate collection of shots. That's all you really have to work with. And I promised myself going into my next film that before I started, I would enunciate this point of view, and I would try and support it through these shots. 
As a filmmaker, um, you really only have three things to work with. You have camera placement. What we don't always realize is on set, a filmmaker has a 360 degree view to choose from. Do I put the camera up high, down low, far away, close up? Next, you have to choose the lens. Wide lens, long lens. Long lens was the second shot. And then there's movement. Uh, and there are different types of movement. One in this, there's no movement. There's dolly, which is a track that keeps the frame locked. There's steady cam movement, which is a gyroscopic device that hangs off the person that wears it, and it, it moves in a very elegant, smooth way. And then there's handheld movement, which is what you see in Jason Bourne movies. And all these things add up together to mean something, um, and to mean a point of view. Usually it's a character point of view, but even when you have all these shots that are a character's point of view, they have to add up to something. They have to mean something. So for my second film, it's called Take Shelter. I wrote it in 2008. The economy was collapsing, the environment was going crazy, and my wife was pregnant. Um, I was very nervous, I was very anxious, and I wanted to make a movie about that. So I designed a film that followed a man who began to have visions of a giant supernatural storm. And he didn't know if these were uh, visions of the future or if they were symptoms of a mental illness uh, that had been running in his family. And I was trying to think visually how I was gonna show this anxiety. And I was sitting on my couch one night and I was watching The Shining by Kubrick. And there's this shot of Jack Nicholson and he's typing at a keyboard and the, the camera's behind him. And it's a wide shot and it's just slowly moving in on him. And I thought, no, Kubrick's moving the camera. Why is he moving the camera? Um, whenever you move the camera, it means something. It means point of view. But whose point of view is that? There's no one else in the room. But it's Kubrick. I know there has to be one. And then I realized there is one. Um, and it's actually the point of view of the Overlook Hotel, if you've seen the film. Uh, the entire hotel is haunted. There is a spirit that is uh, working its way into Nicholson's brain. And that's what the camera was doing. I was like, oh, that's really smart. Uh, I'm going to rip that off. So I designed an entire film around slow, creeping dolly shots. So watch this. This is me ripping off Kubrick. Uh, we mixed that film here at Skywalker, and uh, the first time I ever got to see it finished was in this room, and they were right. It never sounds as good once you leave. So my third film is a film called Mud, and it follows two 14-year-old boys who discover a man hiding out on an island in the middle of the Mississippi River. I knew I wanted to make a film about unrequited love, and I knew I wanted it all to be from the perspective or point of view of a 14-year-old boy. And so, again, I started thinking about things. My first film was totally still, stagnant, uh, my second film had this very, very metered movement. I feel like I hadn't conquered movement yet. And I thought this was the perfect subject for it. Um, one, you have a boy who's constantly in motion, constantly moving. And also you have a film set on the river, the Mississippi River. It moves at about two to three miles per hour. It's the most winding river in the world. Um, very much like the story. So I wanted the camera to move very much like that river, very much like this boy. Um, I wanted there be, to be an elegance to it. And the right tool for that is the Steadicam. Um, I actually think the Steadicam's the closest we come to mimicking human movement, uh, the way our eyes uh, work in our heads. It's actually like a natural gyroscope. So I designed an entire movie around this kind of movement.
What are you doing? I saw that same boot print up in the tree. It's got a cross in the hill. Somebody's been in our boat. Shit. Let's go. You gotta go if you wanna make it back. It takes twice as long going up river. Hold on. Up there, they stop. Where the hell did it go? I don't know. Shit, you know that guy? I've never seen him before. Shit. So you can see in that clip, just like the one from Take Shelter, not every shot moves, uh, like I say. It's a combination of things. It's like a, a toolkit as a director I've started to build on. Uh, they're still shots, they're wide shots, but then certain ones move. And so, kind of the older I've gotten, and the more that I've done this, I start to feel like I'm finally getting prepared to make a movie. Um, and uh, this last thing that I have for you is a new film that I'm working on. It's with Warner Brothers, and they're really nice to let me show it to you. I thought it, it kind of made this point, which is you'll see examples of each type of, of shot that I've kind of shown you here. Some shots will be still, some shots will be steady cam. There is actually a dolly shot in there, if you can tell. But there's a new challenge. Each of my first three films, we shot the majority of things outside during the day. I shoot on film, uh, I don't shoot video, and it's really conducive to being outside during the day. But we don't light anything. It just looks really pretty with the sunlight. And I felt like I had never conquered light. And that was my challenge for this film. And there's a little bit of it that you can see here. But um, this is a film uh, called Midnight Special, and it doesn't need much description. But I'm going to leave you with that, so thanks. Are you okay? We'll be there soon. Why are you wearing those goggles? Huh? Stop! Stop! He's with me. He's my son. Yeah, well, you ought to watch your kid. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. You doing okay? You cannot leave the band. You hear me? I'm sorry. It's okay. I shouldn't have left you. Oh. I'm sorry.